All right, welcome to the show today, everyone. My guest today is Renat Gabitov. He runs an agency called Prometheus, where he helps thought leaders and service-based companies in the peak performance space with their marketing. Previous clients include Stephen Kotler, who's a nine times best-selling author and a two times Pulitzer Prize nominee. Paul Austin, who's the founder of The Third Wave and also the Global Blockchain Forum. He's also the founder of Lifestyle Engineering, which is a private community of life hackers, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and change makers. Through this platform, he's created three pop-up co-living spaces around the world, visited over 70 countries, and built location-independent streams of income. I wanted to bring Renat on the show to find out how he built up his marketing agency, how he applies engineering thinking to the context of life, what he's learned from his experiments in lifestyle design, and what's next for him. So, Renat, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I like to start a bit on the, the background and the story of my guests. So, I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit about your upbringing. As I understand you, you had a bit of an interesting upbringing and did a lot of traveling around. So, I was wondering if you could just share a bit of your story. Uh, absolutely, James. I feel like in order to understand me and uh, what makes uh, me me today uh, has to go back a little bit to my parents and the context of like events back uh, back in the 90s. So I was born in Moscow, Russia, and my my parents are Russian. They were born in the Soviet Union. So a few years before I was born, pretty much the Soviet Union collapsed. And what it meant was that uh, my parents, who were originally like born into like smaller towns uh, in Russia and who had no exposure to the world outside, they could not leave the country. They could not consume any media, TV, information, anything that was not in Russian, that was not filtered. So uh, all of a sudden, the Soviet Union collapses uh, there in Moscow, and they realize that there is this whole world that is open to them. Um, from that point and uh, my, my dad was starting running certain businesses honestly like everything from like textile he had the lemonade factory eventually <laughs> he was selling sugar and food supplements and as he was as he was doing it again Soviet Union collapses and that means that entrepreneurship is on the rise anybody can do anything there are no businesses around so uh, so my dad he started he started really like figuring himself out in this entrepreneurship game and seeing how you can start building the the uh, private uh, the private business industry in in Russia mm. pretty much because there was mm. absolutely nothing so, and then he was also and my mother they were also fascinated by by the world itself so they started traveling and when I, I was born in 1995, so a little bit later, and my, my parents just my parents just took off and they started going around the world. They took me uh, when I was a year old, two years old, three years old, you name it. And yeah, by now I've been to close to 70 countries actually, wow. and that's what that's what really made me uh, a more curious adventurer and traveler, just being being curious and exploring what the world has to offer, what cultures yeah. there are in the world, the, the ways of living that other other people have that I'm not used to. That's amazing. Would you say it's the, you mentioned curiosity. Do you think that's the biggest thing it, it did spark in you or the biggest thing that it, you think it helped with to build that curiosity of the world around you? Because you do seem like a very curious person. <laughs> I, I'd say it definitely contributed to it. Uh, because uh, honestly, I think even a bigger thing than curiosity was the fact that you're just exposed to so many ways of doing things. And uh, I'm, I was no longer just coming up with the linear answers like back in the Soviet Union, people had, hey, there is only like one answer to things. You know, people are wearing one color shirt, one type of <laughs> shoes. Uh, that was that was kind of the opposite. And I was I, I, I did not. I was not around during the Soviet times, but still, there's a lot of that culture that remained uh, in the environment where I was growing up. So I felt like me traveling different places and you know seeing people of different religions, different races, and just doing the most basic things like taking a shower differently, you know, was <laughs> was really cool. I I feel like that made me allowed me to to explore what's possible and like to what I like as opposed to to what my culture tells me is good. Mm, yeah that's awesome and it's amazing um 
I like as well that your your father, you often entrepreneurs start with lemonade stands, but your father started with the lemonade factory. So you kind of took it to the next level there, which I think is amazing. So that's, that's cool. And so why did you want to end up moving to the US? I believe you wanted to go and study there. Could you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I remember... Uh, a little bit more of a backstory. I remember when I, where I was a kid, uh, I had this I had this phase when I was uh, when I, I was I was super curious about stuff, but I didn't have outlets to explore. And I'm I'm a very social person, and I needed somebody like to support my adventures. Uh, so I realized that I was getting more into like computer games and just uh, and just doing unproductive stuff stuff I wasn't super interested in. But the stuff I was in because I, I couldn't really find myself in other ways. And then I listened to this book, Rich, pa- uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was like an audio book I wasn't reading during the time. Um, and and really that that started the whole journey because I realized that knowledge ca- is first extremely entertaining. It's interesting. You can apply it right away. But mm-hmm. it also it also allowed me to think in big ways. So And specifically, I, I thought, hey, if I want to... Uh, if I want to have a fascinating, happy, cool life, I need to surround myself with people like uh, like Robert Kiyosaki, who is the author of that book. I need to surround myself with people who are like-minded, who, who have very similar interests. And I realized that in the United States, the biggest, the coolest entrepreneurs are there, and I wanted to learn from them. So eventually, eventually, I d- decided to go and study in, in the United States. I went to college there. And um, I was I was a little uh, a little surprised by when I came to college and realized that people in in the United States colleges they're actually not there like freshman year. Um, I saw I saw frat parties. I saw people getting drunk for their first time. And you know in Russia the things the, those things happen when you're like 14 or 15. <laughs> and I was there like pumped up to you know to get educated. You know wake up at 6 a.m. and to study uh, study all the time. And 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 I realized that wasn't the case. Uh, which <laughs> which actually which actually took me many different directions. <laughs> Good or bad directions? Great directions. I I just realized that. Um, I took a step and that step was closer to the type of people I want to surround myself with, but that wasn't it. And I read this book by Keith Ferrazzi, which your previous guest also talked about, uh, Never Eat Alone. And the essence of it is building uh, building great relationships and helping helping other people succeed and and just being giving uh, being giving and really focusing on, on surrounding yourself with the right people and that helps you uh, to achieve your big mission and vision in life and that also just creates such a such a great environment in the world where people just want to give 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 as opposed to be taking um, so yeah. and from there I actually studied for two years uh, in in one college that that, that, that wasn't uh, that that, that wasn't particularly it, and I want to I want to find another environment. I I I, f- I transferred to uh, USC to California, and during the time there was a crisis in Crimea. Um, I'm not sure if you remember what happened, but essentially uh, Russia annexed Crimea, and there were a bunch of sanctions in Russia, and that meant our currency collapsed. Um, then uh, the the business that my my dad was in was was in in trouble and uh, the my parents could no longer afford to pay for school uh in in the united states for me and it's it's crazy crazy expensive and i realized i realized hey i'm just gonna go anyways i'm just gonna go to the states anyways i'm gonna go to cali anyways and i'm going to figure figure it out without even going going to college and there i found a community of entrepreneurs that were exactly it like what from from when I was 15, I, I realized that I needed to have certain people who are ambitious and who are working on changing worlds and uh, the world in, in a big way. Um, so I ended up I ended up in this like conference with people who are like light years ahead of me, um, and just through through really you know exposing exposing myself to others uh being giving i met keith ferrazzi uh who who is the author of that book which uh, which i absolutely loved and he changed my life in many ways um and i met some other folks 
that take, took me different directions. I, I finally found myself in the room of uh, like billionaires and entrepreneurs that build mega corporations. And yeah, that was, that was a really, really powerful moment for me. That's great. Is that when you met uh, Tim Draper as well? That's exactly it. And that, that makes a funny story. So I'm, I'm 19 years old. Um, I'm in, interested in businesses, but I've never started anything uh, before. So there is there is uh, Tim Draper that I get introduced to uh, to a friend of mine, and I had this I had this startup idea. I had nothing but this idea, um, <laughs> and I'm sure I'm sure people who are entrepreneurs they probably they probably went through the stage of just having some like uh, probably like stupid idea that they pitch to everybody and they do not have anything solid, and that's exactly where I was. Uh, during the time, so my idea was the uh, the shower head that gives you the temperature exactly the the way you want it uh, right okay. away, and and that wasn't a particularly good idea, and I was terrible at pitching it. I was terrible uh -huh. at pitching it, but I still I still got this this introduction to to Tim Draper. I pitched him the shower idea, and Tim is like, uh, and. For those of you who do not know Tim Draper, Tim Draper, he is this venture capitalist. He invested in SpaceX. Uh, he invested uh, in Skype, uh, through which we're talking right now. And yeah, he is, he is just a, a fascinating entrepreneur himself and a venture capitalist. Um, so uh, I definitely knew who he was. So I'm pitching to him this idea about the shower head, and I'm not doing a good job at all. And then Tim is like, Renat, you have to go through my acceleration program. You have to go. And I'm like, how? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you know, I killed it. <laughs> I killed it. My pitch was so good, which right now looking back, I realize it probably was the opposite. And I'm, probably, I'm also realizing that, uh, that Tim probably invited me, not because I was incredible, but because I could grow and I had the, um, I had the energy. I had the energy. I was I was taking risks and even like talking to him, um, and yeah, he he just took a shot at me, and then I I went through his acceleration program, which which was absolutely amazing, and there are many stories <laughs> from that as well. I can imagine. And I think that's a good point as well because you don't always have to be the the most talented or have the best idea or be the best pitch man. Sometimes just showing that potential and almost like that willingness to learn and that energy, as you said, people pick up on that and it's almost worth more because people know they can develop that further and refine your skills, but not everyone, either someone has that sort of tenacity or energy or they don't a lot of the time. So the fact that you showed that, uh, I believe that, that he would have, would have picked it up. So that's great. Yeah, man. It's more about, in my opinion, it's, it's more about just, just being like brave enough to, to fail and take risks and to put yourself in front of people that, uh, that are ahead of you and, and, and that's okay. And just, just taking risks because if we do not take any risks, there will be, there'll be no rewards. There, there's no, no potential. If things were that easy, then everybody would be doing them. So like be, being brave and just, just going for it is, is one of my motives. Yeah, I love it. It's great. So then at some point you moved back to Russia to to work on a import export business, I believe. Was that after the the accelerator you went through with Tim Draper? Exactly. Yeah. So the accelerator with Tim was awesome. What actually ended up happening is there was a a TV show on ABC Family. So when I walked in and I I had no idea the extent to which uh Th th that would be so essentially like you're working the acceleration program instead of just building your business you have you have at least three cameras looking at you they're like boom mics coming from all the all the angles um and um and yeah i went through the program we we did some some cool stuff called the the, the survival week where you pretty much like train with navy seals um you you survive <laughs> i'll not go too much into that but yeah after that i after the acceleration program i went back to russia and i was um i was finishing some studies and um and i i was just i was just hungry to start something real something uh something that's uh, that was a real business and something that had uh real cash flows so during during the time uh, during the time so in you russia didn't get rich off the off the shower heads no, no. The, the shower heads was, I was working on like five different things at, at the time. Um, I started building the mobile application 
um, with with which I went to I went to the acceleration program. Um, okay. Essentially, like essentially, I had um, around nine uh, nine people on the team, not like full time, just college students, you know, programming things and uh, and building out this app. Really, really, just dabbing at this whole entrepreneurship world. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what I went there with. And then I realized I realized like, hey, I, I want uh, in order to have a business, you need to have like cash flows, revenues. You need to have a real thing. And I was I was still probably like 19 years old or 20 years old. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to you know to deal with people and sell real stuff and deliver value. So I started importing electronic cigarettes and vapes from uh, f- from China to Russia and doing wholesale with them. And that was a fun experience. What and year was that? That was that was 2015, I believe. Yeah, right. Good timing for that industry. Oh yeah, that was perfect. That was that was perfect. Especially in Russia, there was a law that prohibited uh, smoking indoors, and uh, there are a lot of uh, smokers in Russia. And the funny thing, I, I was not a smoker uh, myself. <laughs> I don't smoke, and I I don't really I'm, I don't really like it. But um, I just wanted to start with something. Right now, I realize that I need to have this perfect alignment with the type of impact I want to make in order to be successful at something. Uh, yeah. But during the time I was just starting, just kind of dabbing in things and trying trying to see what works. Yeah, makes sense. So how did that work out for you, that import-export business? Did you get any traction with it? Uh, we got a little bit of traction. Um, the it was it was a cool it was a cool experiment uh, because I needed essentially to find suppliers in China, and I needed to distribute it in in Russia in order to find suppliers in China. So I had I found this um, my my business partners during the time they were selling like uh, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of worth of guitar equipment, um, and they they built the biggest the biggest shop. Uh, in in Russia for that online store for that. So I partnered up with them. They were really good friends. And then they told me that if you buy anything online, especially wholesale from from China, you're just going to fail and you have to go go yourself to China and go visit factory factories and and see things for yourself, build the relationships. So I literally I said, OK, um, I'm used to traveling and I'm, I love meeting new people, new cultures and um, and so I, I, I just got got a ticket to China one way and and started going through the factory floor, floors in in this in this remote kind of villages that were still huge but uh, for for China it's pretty small and just going by myself no translator nothing else <laughs> uh, uh, through through the factories and trying to yeah trying to uh, find find good suppliers and we eventually did. Um, so the the business wow. went okay. We just realized we just realized that wasn't the thing that we're as passionate about. Uh, but yeah, we did we did a couple a couple of rounds. <laughs> That's amazing. Would have been a great experience going through those those factories by yourself, especially. <laughs> so I love that. Well, so then you ended up going back to the states, I believe. So what was um, what was your plan then when you moved back to the US after doing that import export business for a while? I realized that um, technology is the tool that that is changing the world and that will be changing the world no matter what. Uh, so I got fascinated by technology and that was because of the acceleration program. And yeah, I started I started immersing myself into into the startup scene, learning how how software companies are doing things, uh, helping some entrepreneur friends of mine uh, here and there, and just just kind of to summarize this 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 whole uh, this this whole journey of me starting entrepreneurship, I literally tried everything I could. Uh, I tried every industry. I tried every every position. I cold called. I wrote marketing emails. I did business development. I did everything I could in order to in in order to just advance. And then slowly certain patterns and beliefs started forming in my head and that that actually would help me uh, just just doing things. Mm, I love that. That's such a key point. Do lots of stuff and then you start to refine what you like and what you're good at and it all kind of 
become the puzzle pieces start falling into place. It's never, I always worry about people who just want to wait for that one hit of like motivation or inspiration where they finally think they know what they're going to do with their life. It's always a, sometimes a process of elimination or iteration of just trying lots of different things and seeing what works for you. So I totally get that. Exactly. So, so then what were you, what was starting to fall into place for you? The, so the technology aspect was a part of it. Was there any specific sector that you started to look into or what was your kind of moves then? Um, I looked at, I looked at uh, some education platforms uh, and I was personally very passionate about personal development. I was reading a bunch and um, I, I looked into building a platform that leverages artificial intelligence to give people personalized recommendations on what they should be learning from. Um, at the type of online courses, the type of materials, and increasing, yeah, increasing their effectiveness in learning. The the funniest thing there was that I had no idea what artificial intelligence was. I had no <laughs> idea how it works, and and maybe until until a year later, when or a couple of years later, when I actually studied that stuff, um, I, I I realized I realized how naive I was. But <laughs> I, again, I love. I love doing all of those things and just just trying. And I, I feel like a lot of people in the world, what they do is they, they go to school because they were told that you need to go to school. Some of them go to college and then they get the job. And then after the job, they get another job or whatever. And they don't get to really explore what's out there. And how can you find yourself on what, what you're passionate about if, if, you never, if you never tried all of those other things? So I yeah. really embrace my curiosity and I feel like before focusing on the one thing that you want to create, you need to first kind of understand yourself better. And the best way to understand, your, understand yourself better is by exposing yourself to a lot of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So is this when, um, so you've been exposing yourself to a lot of stuff and sort of narrowing that focus. Is this about the time when lifestyle engineering came about? Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, so for, for those of you who do not know, lifestyle engineering is a is a personal development community uh, for people who embody one mindset, and that's the engineering mindset uh, in the context of their lives. So what the essence of the engineering mindset is rapid iteration, and it has three three components to it: uh, analyze, design, and implement. So by analyzing in the context of life, you ask yourself questions like, hey, what type of life do I want? Like uh, if I was to look back at my life, how do I want it to have looked like? Uh, so analyzing yourself and what you want and and based on and design is the second step in design. You're like, OK, I think I know what I want. You make assumptions and and you design a you design the life that you want to live. And the third part is the actual execution. A lot of people in the beginning of the year, it's it's New Year's Eve, they they sign up for gyms, they do all of those things, they write down everything they want to do, but they don't actually do it. So the, the third part is actually doing it. Um, and <laughs> and the beautiful thing is it's 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 a cycle. So after after you implement, you analyze it again and you ask yourselves questions like, oh, uh, am I actually passionate about it? Uh, do I actually like it? Uh, and questions like this, and then based on that analysis, you can design a better solution, um, and you can you can make adjustment uh, adjustments in your lifestyle design, um, and then you implement again, and and with that uh, cycle of rapid iteration, you can you can really find what you love. Mm. I love that, and this is this is starting to get to the sort of stuff that I love talking about. So <laughs> we're we're in good territory here. So I'm curious maybe if we could dive a little deeper into that perhaps, like how does someone actually, so it sounds great, like analyze, um, design and implement, great, three steps is perfect. I guess like what would be your advice to someone in terms of actually like taking action on that and implementing that, those three steps? Like how does someone actually analyze and then design their life? Is it just a case of as you were sort of saying with your story, just trying a bunch of different stuff and seeing what you like and then sort of reflecting on that. Do you have a specific like journaling practice or something? Maybe if there's any sort of tactics you could could share there. 
I love the question, and I definitely wouldn't recommend, hey, try everything. Try being a janitor for a week. Try this, try that. Uh, I think it's important to make assumptions. So, and ma making assumptions is wh where you where you really think um, and reflect what you statistically or his what you historically enjoy doing and what you are uh, good at, just based on your experience. And then you make assumptions. Uh, you make assumptions in terms of uh, what you what you think you like, and 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 then from from there you can you can try things out. For me, the way I do it right now is I thought about I thought about what type of life do I want to live and what type of impact do I want to make. So what I created is I created a manifesto, um, wh which goes through nine different categories of life. Everything from body to mind to romantic relationships, personal relationships, business, uh, philanthropy work I want to do. And it's an open source document. It's around 40 pages long right now. And by open source, it's in Google Docs and it's open to everybody and people can comment and say, and, and they can propose their ideas and they can share their learnings or they can say, hey, Renat, based on what I know about you, I do not think you really, you know, you really want uh, to to do this thing, like to make a billion dollar or whatever. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, I, I structure it this way. I, I have this manifesto, nine different categories, open source document, which gives me more information, more analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I look at it. I look at it um, every every month, sometimes more more often. And the beautiful thing about about creating your plans is that your plans they need to be uh, they need to be smart, uh, which mm -hmm. is um, which is a methodology for goal setting. But they also need to be flexible. And by flexible, um, I do not expect myself five years from now to want the exactly the same things I want today. Mm -hmm. And and having it in a Google Doc, I can go exactly to the first version or to the to the second version of the document and see what has changed. And observing the change is fundamental because when I observe the change, I, I see the growth and that gives me extra motivation and extra understanding of myself. Yeah, it's so cool. And this, this Life Manifesto document, it's an impressive document. I had a, had a good read through it. Is this something um, that I can share in the show notes for, for people if they want to check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Make, for people listening, make sure you go look at it because I, yeah, I was blown away by this. I really love it. It's basically, like Renat was just saying, it's all these visions that he has for his life and everything's laid out and it's an evolving document, which is just what I love. It's not just a fixed thing. It's people are commenting on it. People are saying, do you really want this? Is this, have you thought about this different thing? And it's, it's a really cool document. And I think it's a, it's a great exercise that people could apply to their own life of just really like actually putting down into words and texts, like what are the things that I care about? What do I want to work towards? And then actually, reflecting on that and reviewing it and updating it and and having this constant companion through all the, the journeys you're going through i think it's a a really cool exercise and something that that i want to do a bit in a bit more detail for myself so thanks for the inspiration there <laughs> renat yeah so and just, good. just to add to this really quick i believe that having this this type of document this type of manifesto helps you to have a vector in life and so you have all of these things where you want to be good at you don't only want to be wealthy and have a great lifestyle but you also want to have great healthy relationships uh, and all of those things and uh, by having a vector what i mean is that we uh, especially curious people we do a lot of stuff but we don't want to sporadically be doing everything we want to have a direction into which we're kind of aiming or something that is related to the type of life we want to build. So, and that vector helps you with decision making. When I'm when I'm thinking when I'm thinking about um, about the, even the, the simple things, um, say say we're taking friends category uh, in 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 that manifesto, and I have three types of people I can hang out with tonight. Mm -hmm. I know exactly the type of relationships I want to build in my life long term. So and I know how they want to how they're going to look like. And that helps me that helps me come up with activities and the people that I'll be hanging out with tonight. And all of those small micro decisions compound to be giving you this momentum that actually brings you closer to the life you envision. Mm, yeah, makes total sense. I love it. So 
how did so you've got this kind of concept of lifestyle engineering which i love being a being a technical person myself and and running experiments in lifestyle design so i love that how did that evolve into what lifestyle engineering is which is as i said in the introduction a group of sort of high performers and entrepreneurs and and how did it evolve into having these co-living pop-ups around the world maybe you could just talk a bit about the journey of of how all that came about Absolutely. So there, there, there are a couple, there are a couple points. The, the, the first one, the first one is the community itself, and the community is essentially people who embody this mindset uh, of life, of engineering and who care about building a great lifestyle and being whole uh, from like the happiness, professional successes, etc. Perspectives. So that was just me organically meeting the type of people I'm fascinated by and I want to surround myself with. And uh, that was a really good excuse to create a mastermind group where all of those people can interact and they can ask experts in different categories of life uh, for advice. Uh, that's the community part, and I'm absolutely loving it. People are also loving it. We're doing, uh, we're doing biweekly mastermind calls on different topics. Uh, the houses are a very a, a very different thing so um a little bit more context about myself i've been i've been nomadic i ran out of um a visa in in a number of countries um and that set me on a little journey traveling around the world i traveled all over asia uh europe um and and other 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 spots and I realized, I realized through my journeys, I realized that uh, in order for me to, to feel happier and to be more productive and to really feel like I'm living the best life uh, ever, I needed to have like-minded people around and I needed to have engineer this environment. And, and the, the housing situation, when you, travel, uh, when you travel and stay places for a month, two months, three months, um, Living at hotels is expensive and it's a little, a little boring because you're just alone in, in one place and you can only wander around town. And um, and there wasn't really that many alternatives that that I found. So I realized myself in this situation where I'm I'm lacking the social connection. I'm lacking this environment. I want I want to find for myself. So I found myself in Barcelona. There was a personal development program that was a month long. Um, and I needed again to to live somewhere for the next two months in in Barcelona. And Barcelona is pretty expensive uh, in terms of in terms of the living costs. Um, so so it was it was me and a friend of mine. We started we started our brainstorming session. We thought, how about we get a place there? How about we rent a boat and <laughs> live in the boat and take the boat on the weekends and cruise around Spain, uh, stuff like that. Um, how about we get a, uh, a bus? And then all of those ideas uh, really eventually got us to, to realizing we don't, need to, we don't need to get something for ourselves. Maybe there are many other people, especially going through that personal development program, who have the same, who have the same problem. We couldn't find uh, affordable enough housing that will bring us all together. So we realized that Yes, there were a lot of people made a little post on Facebook um, with a link to uh, to Google Forms where people applied. We had like over 30 applications. We realized, hey, uh, we know exactly how much people want to pay because that's what was one of one of the things in the forms. And all of these people applied to live with us. Let's <laughs> let's build a co-living space. So we hired a little virtual assistant who helped us research uh, research. Uh, real estate in in Barcelona. We ended up renting out this beautiful, beautiful eight-bedroom apartment in the main street in Passeig de Gracia, uh, in in Barcelona, which was which was like one of the most expensive streets in Barcelona. <laughs> so, from us uh, looking for affordable living, we were living in like the Bowler's apartment with all of this amazing <laughs> other people. Um, yeah, living like on, on the main street right in front of uh, right in front of the Gaudi's buildings. And <laughs> we, yeah, we, we realized that we realized that we had the best months in our lives living in that co-living space. And that uh, led us to starting uh, two more co-living spaces. And in fact, the person I started with uh, he right now is one of the top thought leaders in the in the co-living in the co-living industry, and that's yeah. just because of just following our curiosity and 
and exploring. I love it. That's so cool. So you've done um, how many of these? You've done three of these now around the world, I believe. Is there something you're you're going to keep doing? Are you going to keep growing this this uh, these co living spaces in other places? That's a great question. So uh, we did, yeah, we did a couple more. We did one in Tulum, Mexico, uh, which was about us renting out this uh, this beautiful villa in the middle of the jungle and inviting entrepreneurs over to to co live and co work with. Um, we did that for around five. And we did another house uh, for four months in in Barcelona, uh, as well. Um, we're we're going to do a house in in Portugal, but for, for us, like it was making a little bit of money when we were starting that, and that was that was beautiful uh, because that was sustainable and that allowed us to live in beautiful places with amazing people. Uh, but right now, it's it's more about uh, it's more about for me focus. So I would love to join other co living spaces instead of starting my own because it's a lot of work. Um, mm. But we are we are renting renting another villa in Portugal actually in. September, uh, just for ourselves, because we no longer care as much about uh, making things affordable. We just want to surround ourselves with awesome people. And yeah, we're opening up. We're opening up another co co living space in in Portugal for a couple months, so that um, so that my friend can write a book on co living and really um, really be in that environment and focus. And for me to also have like this two month sprint where I can be working on the, my projects. That's amazing. It really sounds like a amazing way to to live because you kind of, as you said, you get the benefit of being surrounded with other motivated, driven people. You also get the benefit of being able to live in amazing places you might not be able to necessarily afford if you're just by yourself. And just sounds like an all around awesome idea. <laughs> so, do you have um? Who's this like suitable for? Like, do you take applications from from anyone or? Like, is it like a select group of people? How do you normally decide sort of who who comes to these sort of things? Well, the the odds are the odds are if um, if I'm I, that I have a I have friends that are just like me, and and if I know if I know people who are like me and who embody this this mindset, then friends of friends also know those people. So essentially, essentially the way the way we build it, it's it's all through referral. Uh, we do have we do have a vlog uh, a blog that brings in uh, around five thousand people a month on the page, and we have some applications from there. But for for the most part, for the most part, it's it's all through referral, and this is a vehicle for me to to meet people I want to be friends with. So essentially, it's like a lead generation machine for friends. <laughs> uh, which I absolutely loved. Yeah, it's a good excuse to meet with people, to talk with people, and yeah, to be building building your relationships. I love it. That's such such a great idea, and it's funny that you mention that because I kind of view the podcast in in the same light as well. It's it's a good excuse for me to reach out to interesting people and have interesting conversations. But I think if I was able to offer a, an awesome eight bedroom apartment for people, that'll probably be more powerful. So <laughs> I think you're onto a good thing there. <laughs> totally and we do that in in, in our community um, we don't have co-living going on uh, year, year year round but we're so close we're like a little family when we travel we stay at each other's places we do quarterly retreats so uh, every second quarter um, I, I guess biannual retreats uh, we, every 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 second quarter we we meet at the location and we reflect on our goals the ones that we set out in in the beginning of the year and we see if we're going the right direction we have accountability yeah we jam and and have a great time we did one in Joshua Tree Park um, in in Southern California actually yeah. that was so much fun it sounds like yeah it sounds amazing and uh, there's so much stuff I want to get through so, <laughs> with with this interview, and we could talk for hours, I think. So, uh, one thing I was really interested to know about as well, because the <laughs> I get the the impression that you're you're a real like hustler. You're you're real. Uh, you think differently, and you're not afraid to be bold. There was actually an interesting medium post that you wrote about. How to how to use luxury hotel amenities for free. <laughs> <laughs> 
and that's the sort of stuff I love um, being resourceful and not being afraid to be a bit bold and for, for people who are listening basically that was Renat's guide to kind of being able to use like uh, <laughs> luxury hotel amenities without actually having to pay for a room and stay there so where did you where did you get that boldness from? I was curious. Have you just always been that way, or was there? I'm just curious. Like, do you think it was just something you were born with, or or what? How how was that developed? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, th- th- that's a that's a hard question, and um, <laughs> the the bigger question is if we have free will and uh, if we if we really get to influence uh, our our environment, what we're really born with and working with. Uh, for for me, in my case. Uh, in my case, uh, it's it's honestly hard to say. Uh, I see myself I've evolved in so many directions, but um, but I believe I believe the the one thing that allowed me to think uh, different and to do things unlike many others is by being honest with myself and others. Um, you remember you remember that that cycle I told you about analyze, design, implement, right? So. Imagine, imagine right now your analysis tool, which whatever is giving you information, is broken. Um, like I'm, I'm lying to myself. I'm not telling myself the truth about uh, about how much I weigh, you know, how uh, or whatever else. Then, then your whole system will not be working out. Uh, your system, you cannot design the solution that that is true to you because uh, be- because there's just no good data flowing in. Uh, so to me, to me, honestly, being being radically transparent with myself and speaking speaking my beliefs to everybody around me, my friends, my companies, being vulnerable and uh, and constantly asking for feedback and embracing any type of feedback uh, is probably it. So just just being very honest and and authentic. Uh, th- those are the things that allowed me to really explore explore and think in new ways mm. makes sense being uh i think a lot of people struggle to be honest with themselves and if you can do that then it does it does open you up to to being um to growing in some interesting ways so i, I get well that. james it, it's it's a muscle right uh it's a muscle it, and it's hard to, conf- to confront hard truth about ourselves especially the ugly truth Right, and the reason it's hard is because we have so many fears that are holding us back, um, that are bringing us back to comfort and to uh, to the stories we told ourselves. Uh, but but yeah, man, that's mm. that's what I believe. So there was one thing that you you put on your bucket list, which was swimming under the stars on Necker Island, which is Richard Branson's private island, and. And this is something else that you make publicly available as well, your, your bucket list, which is an interesting read. So, and I saw that that one was ticked off. So maybe you could tell the story of, of how that actually ended up happening. Yeah, man, that was, that was another cool story. So um, I, went to, I went to Cali uh, after that Crimea crisis <laughs> in, uh, in Russia. And I, I was thinking about like the type of life I want to live and the type of experiences I want to know that I have done just looking back uh, at my life. And I started writing my bucket list, which is all, all those experiences. Right now, it's also publicly available. It's around 110 items. Uh, that specific item about <laughs> about, about Necker Island, uh, that was really funny. So um, I woke up at 6 a.m. with my with some of my best friends who are also into personal development. Again, uh, people who surround me have massive impact uh, on, on the direction I went. And... Um, and I started when we drove to 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 meet the sunrise and um, and one of the first five things that I wrote was to kite surf with Richard Branson on Necker Island. I was massively influenced by Richard Branson and by his uh, quote unquote screw it, let's do it mentality, just doing stuff and exploring. And that's that's the mindset I embody right now. And probably uh, you you also had a little bit of a glimpse on uh, through through this call through this interview. Um, so, so yeah, I, I thought no limitations. I want to hang out. I want to, I know I, I love kite surfing, Richard Branson kite surfs. I, I want to kite surf with him on Necker Island. Um, the <laughs> next thing that's, that happens, um, I, I ask a virtual assistant to give me a list of all places where Richard Branson was going to be in the next year. 
and I had the spreadsheet of, of, of the place he was going to be. I started bra browsing around the, the places and I realized he was going to be judging at a private event on, on his island, on Necker Island, um, in, in a few months from then. So I looked through the event and I realized that I know one person who is going to be the judge there. And that person is Tim Draper. So ah. <laughs> I, I hit up Tim Draper. I'm like, Tim, um, you know, I really want to go. I, I really want to go. I really want to represent, like, uh, represent you and uh, Drape University, etc. Can I come? Like, how can I come? And mm -hmm. then he, the, what he did was was really a massive, massive gift. Um, he he literally replied to 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 my email, CCing the organizer of this event, and he said, "Hey guys, I'm not sure if I can still make it." But Renat would love to come instead of me, or something, something wow. like that. And yeah, that that got me to to Necker Island itself. And yeah, and and from there, I was I was just literally walking walking around Necker Island to to start kite surfing. And I see Richard <laughs> Branson, you know, walking toward me. So I gave him a hug and everything, uh, said hi, and then he he was uh, he was. Grabbing his kite, I grabbed my kite, and we went. We went in the water. Um, it was wow. a, a relatively brief, brief thing, and I'm sure he doesn't remember it. But the the beautiful the beautiful thing is just manifesting, manifesting what you want and making it happen. Because when I wrote it down, I had the idea planted in my head, and then I took some small actions that eventually allowed me to to cross off that bucket list item, and that was only. 15 months, I think, since the moment when I was this 19-year-old kid writing it down um, on, a, on a piece of paper to me actually being in one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world's island and, and going for a kite surfing session. So cool. Such a good story. And that's, that's something I want to expand upon a bit as well because I've noticed the same thing as well. Like people say law of attraction or all that kind of stuff with writing stuff down or like thinking about it. And I kind of believe it, but not in the way that I think some people believe in it. I think it, as you said, it's kind of like you put the, you write it down and it puts the seed in your head and you subconsciously just start looking for opportunities to actually make that happen. And it's when I started doing this podcast, I had a list of um, people that I eventually wanted to interview and, and I thought, a lot of these would take years or may not ever happen and I've, and I've actually ended up interviewing a few of those people that I wrote down right at the start. So again, it's, it wasn't, I don't think it's magic. It was just, it plants that idea and then you start, start working towards and making small steps. So it's a good, uh, good thing to do. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, so have you got another like 10, 15 minutes? Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Cool. Cause we're, we're going a bit over time here, but I'm having such a good conversation. I just want to keep it going. And one thing I really wanted to make sure we talk about before we finish up is what you're doing with uh, Prometheus. That's something I'm a bit curious about. So could you just talk a little bit about what Prometheus is and, and how that came about? Absolutely. Uh, so I started my, my journey uh, after coming to the Silicon Valley and living there and dabbling in so many different industries. I realized that in order to be successful, I need to have a skill set. So I needed to be really, really good at one thing. And that thing will allow me to be marketable, to be co-founders with other people and to create value really. So hustle was just not going to cut it. That's uh, that's not a very very good skill uh, to have by itself. <laughs> so I realized that I'm passionate about marketing, and mainly because of human psychology and the understanding people and telling stories. Um, during the time, my mentor uh, Ron Miller he was he was running an equity crowdfunding um, uh, platform. So equity crowdfunding is essentially um, a way for you to raise uh, to raise capital for your business, but instead of uh, raising it from big investors that invest hundreds of thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars, you can raise as little as 200 bucks from uh, from your following. So yeah, that's that's what got me into into marketing because Ron told me that hey, there is this huge unsatisfied niche. Businesses do not know how to raise capital. They do not have any marketing arms. So I said, okay, let's let's do this. <laughs> Similar thing, screw it, let's do it. Um, 
we started a marketing marketing agency that was affiliated with um, with that equity crowdfunding platform. So we had we had clients coming in, and I really had to figure out all of the marketing I could uh, without having prior experience, just on the go, working with budgets, working with companies. Um, yeah, so f- from from that it, it evolved into Prometheus, which is the marketing agency I'm running right now. And what we do is we're working with with thought leaders and service-based agencies in the peak performance space. And peak performance is pretty much like biohacking, like neurofeedback training uh, type of stuff. So uh, uh, areas that help people reach, people and companies reach peak performance states. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what we do. And right now I'm working, uh, I'm working with uh, Stephen Kotler, like you mentioned, who co-wrote um, this book called uh, Abundance and Bold. They're about... Uh, they're about exponential technologies, which are really fascinating reads. Uh, some of the biggest uh, books that really transformed my life. Uh, we also work with uh, we also work with um, like the most famous uh, football player in in Mexico. Uh, right now, we work with people in the personal development space, like Diego Dreyfus, uh, who has uh, like a big following. And uh, the re- the reason I love working with thought leaders is because I get to have my thoughts and my impact distributed to millions of others. And um, instead of instead of building a following myself. We provide systems and infrastructure for those people to to do what they do a little bit better or a little bit differently. That's awesome. And I, I was curious. So you work with thought leaders, as you said. How do you, how did you get them as clients initially? Because I think a lot of people would love to work with thought leaders because obviously they they themselves can bring great exposure to your work if you do a good job. So how do you actually get people like Stephen Kotler or some of these footballers, these people, how do you actually get them as clients initially? That's that's a great question. Uh, and so the, the big paradigm shift I had is that um, if I, I, I realized that if I, if I have the, if I had thought leaders to, how to say it, Actually, just just being humble, uh, just just being humble. Uh, before I remember, m- most people, if you're in the marketing space or in the, in in any service uh, in any service based type of company, uh, a lot of people they do not want to pay you until they see the results, right? Um, and 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 what what I realized that I, I was really getting frustrated by uh, by some of the some of the people through my network. Who are successful? Who didn't want to pay me for for my work and my team's work, and uh, that frustrated me a little bit. But then I realized, what if I use this as an opportunity to invest into into my business? Say I make zero from it, it doesn't succeed, but I'm going. How much am I, how much effort am I putting into growing growing this business? And um, and that allowed me to really start looking at um, at working for. For those those thought leaders and people with big names already, who I I knew from relationship building, um, to to really start doing small work for them, and then eventually it started escalating, and those thought leaders started introducing me to other thought leaders, and people that uh, that follow the thought leaders, they wanted to be like uh, like them, and they started they started talking to us, and they started they started asking if they can uh, get similar similar results. So, so yeah, just like by being humble in the beginning, lending those few clients and, um, and really going out of your way to produce the results that you want and make their lives a little bit easier serving them. Uh, even, even if you need to do all of this work up front. Yep. Makes total sense. Be humble at the start, be willing to do work sometimes for, for free or not as, as much as you necessarily like to charge. Think of the long game of how that's going to help you down the road. I love it. It's great advice. And how do you actually think about marketing? So for you specifically as a marketing agency, what a, what value are you delivering to your clients? Is it because there's some people who think of marketing as just say generating leads via Facebook ads or doing sales funnels or something like that. But I mean, 
I'm just curious how you actually think about marketing as a whole and what the sort of services you offer to your clients are. That's a really good question. And that's that's what I think um, that a lot of entrepreneurs need to need to really really invest a little bit more time into thinking about uh, a, a lot of things like sales funnels, for example, or lead gen through, through Facebook ads. A lot of those things that, that we use are just, uh, just tools that were already created that seem to work. And then we just like kind of copy paste that solution into our businesses and hope that they succeed. Um, I believe that, that marketing is not about the sales funnel or or like the lead gen tool with facebook ads uh, marketing is about understanding how people work and understanding what makes people uh, want to to buy something from you so um so essentially essentially the way i look at this is that um there there is the principles there are the principles and there are the fundamentals in 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 marketing uh the principles are are the most important things um, to like understanding your target audience. They're understanding the message uh, that y- you want to create to appeal to that to that target audience. And then the third part, uh, the third part is creating a product that actually serves that target audience with with their pain points and with everything. And you would be surprised. You would be surprised how few companies in marketing know about about their target audiences and their customers' target audiences. They just run some ads on, you know, onto a squeeze page or whatever it is, or they build sales funnels without profoundly understanding their customers. So in the, uh, in understanding, in understanding customers, uh, you, what you need to know is you need to know people's desires, what they tried before that didn't work, of what of what their walls are, what's holding them back from achieving the outcomes, uh, and really trying to help them uh, overcome those, um, understanding their biggest pain points. Um, and in the message stage uh, that I mentioned, your job as any company is to communicate that um, that your your company will help you achieve the desired result. And and help instill trust in in that in, in you as a company to to bring people to the desired result. Uh, second is to allow people to understand that with your tool they can believe in themselves and they can do uh, what's what you're promising them to do. Uh, so if people don't believe in themselves, they will not buy from you either way because um, it doesn't matter. Uh, it really doesn't matter what tools you have. The third part is showing that the value greatly exceeds the price. Uh, the fourth part is the time, which uh, which which is about uh, which is about uh, saving time and making the time worthwhile. Because if people do not have the time to use your solution, they're just not going to buy it. Uh, they're overwhelmed. They're busy. Uh, yeah. And the, the fifth part is clarity. Um, the fifth part is clarity, telling them exactly what the next step is going to be, and um, and showing them that the outcome that they want is dependent on them taking this next small step and those are those are uh, the components the five components of a of the perfect message um, that go through all of the objection to sale and again man uh, james what, what, what I, I love your question because most people they focus on social media they they focus on the next tweet they want to put out or they focus on the ad they they need to release if they do not have the perfect audience, the perfect messaging, and the great product, they're not going to be successful. And the, um, the mechanics are those tools. Um, and there are mm-hmm. millions of tools, and there are billions of combinations of those tools that you can come up with. If you understand the principles, the fundamentals right, then everything else becomes super easy. And that's that's how we look at, at marketing in general at Prometheus. Yeah, I love that. You sort of start with the... You almost look at it more from a psychology point of view. And as you said, those sort of first principles and uh, fundamentals, and then the the things on top of that are just tactics that kind of fall into place, I guess. So um, I love the way you look at it. It's really interesting. Yeah, so that's that's amazing, and I really love the the work you're doing with Prometheus there. So I'm glad we we can we can talk a little bit about that. And sort of coming up on the the end of the interview. Yeah, Renat, it's been an awesome conversation, but I've just got a few few quick questions just to, to close us out on. And I think um, you seem to be quite a voracious reader, so I was curious to know what's uh, what's your favorite book or a book that's had 
a really massive impact on your your life you've mentioned a few throughout the interview but if you've got one specific one love to hear it <laughs> that's such a good question um i i'd probably say uh, i'd probably say principles by ray dalio a lot of people have been saying that recently it's a great book yeah principle pr principles essentially goes goes through uh through two areas the principles and this is similar to what i just described understanding principles and business uh in in marketing before before doing anything uh, ray dalio talks about life principles and principles in business that he learned throughout his years i know like 40 45 years um in business and building billion dollar companies uh that that work um and yeah those are just like the fundamental beliefs that he has um, that allows him to achieve the results that he achieves with his companies. Yeah, absolutely. I shouldn't be too surprised that you love that one because it's very much an engineering way of looking at, at life, <laughs> having systems and for decision making and, and all that. So I love that. So what's coming up next for you, Renat? You've got a lot of things going on, a lot of cool stuff that we've sort of discussed in the past hour, but just curious to know what's, I mean, if we want to know your 10-year plan, we can go check out your life manifesto. But in the next, say, year or so, what are you, what are you up to? Right now, right now, I'm going to be super focused on building out Prometheus. And um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be, I'll be um, building, building a little bit of, a, um, of an education. I guess I'll, I'll, be, bu I'll be building educational tools for people to learn about about marketing itself because i feel like i feel like a lot of the a lot of w what people read and think about marketing is extremely outdated i hated my my marketing class in in college and uh what i'm doing right now is i'm doing marketing so yeah i'd love i'd love to educate um founders on marketing and i'd love people to really start thinking it from from this new perspective that's awesome. So putting out some, some educational resources around marketing. That's great. Can't, can't wait to see that. So is there anything I haven't asked you or just anything you want to really make sure that you pass on to the audience before we finish up here, Renat? I, I think we covered so much ground in, in this call. So um, yeah, I, I loved everything. Um, yeah, I, I, wish, I wish I could provide a little bit more context for... Uh, for, for stories and other things and uh, like at Prometheus like using 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 the the exact philosophy and the principles I just mentioned we're actually able to to achieve massive results we, we had one of the biggest events in the world one of the biggest live events in the world we've created uh, actually that made made when the platform uh, crash uh, we <laughs> uh, yeah just uh, just just those small things s small things that help people understand that help people understand that the, the context behind um behind some of some of the stories yeah 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 there's a lot of i'm sure we could probably have a, a three-hour joe rogan interview if you want to dive deep into the into some of the stories you've had but um yeah definitely from what i've seen you've had a lot of successes in in the clients you've worked for so people can definitely go check out some of those success stories and and touch base with you if they have any more questions, I think. But yeah, last last question is really just what's the best way for people to connect, Renat, if they want to check out what you're up to, whether it's lifestyle engineering, Prometheus, or just reach out to you personally. What's What are the best channels to do that on? A great question. Uh, I'm off social media these days to have my crisp focus. Uh, so email is probably the best tool. Um, I'll leave leave my email uh, probably to you, and hopefully we can include those in the show notes, um, sure. as well as lifestyle engineering, uh, and and the agency. But email is probably the best way to reach out. What is that? Just off the I'll include in the show notes, but just for people listening, what is the best email? Uh, it's Renat at cmo dot one, o n e. Awesome, and I'll make sure that's linked up, and also the links to your your various websites. So. Yeah, I mean, this was an awesome conversation, Renata. I really appreciate you you jumping on the call today. Everyone listening, make sure you go check out some of the stuff Renat's up to. He's 
like I've said in the interviews, just really interesting guys. Thinks a lot differently, thinks boldly, isn't afraid to take action and, and try things and take risks and he's achieved a lot at a at a very early stage and I'm sure that'll only continue to to grow as, as we go on. So Renat, thank you very much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me, James. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the interview with Renat. I hope you got a lot of value from it. If you use Apple Podcasts, I've got a real quick favor to ask. Could you go into the app and leave me a rating and review for the show? Because it really helps me out with the show ranking and helps grow the audience and means more, more people can listen to the content that I put out. And if you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can still help me out. You could take a screenshot of yourself listening to this podcast, post it on Instagram stories, tag me in that. I'm at J Harris, which is J H. A double R I triple S. And if you could do any of those two things, it would really help me out and it would mean a lot. So, hope you enjoyed the episode and hope you have a great day.